We looked at the transfiguration account in Luke chapter 9 last week. Three of the apostles had seen the metamorphosis. They had seen the glory, doxa, like doxology. They had seen the glory of Jesus and Moses and Elijah. It will be interesting to read their reaction a little bit later in today's text. They saw the glory of the kingdom of God, and the next day, they were arguing with each other as to who would be the greatest. I think that sort of fits human nature. But uh, they saw the glory of the Savior and the glory of the kingdom of God, and he shined gleaming white. Mark says, more white than any launderer could make it. And the result of seeing Moses and Elijah and Jesus in glory was that the next day they are arguing which of them will get the most glory. I think that uh, compulsion as to who is the greatest is very common to human nature. And uh, we will see that in the apostles' example, and we'll get to that part of Luke 9 a little bit later today. We start in uh, Luke 9 at verse 37 with yet another case of demon possession. They're uh, leaving the mountain and they're going down the road and that's the first thing they see, although as they keep walking they're going to argue with each other over who is the greatest. There seem to be quite a few demon possessions in Luke. In Luke chapter 4, they were in the synagogue in Capernaum. What do we have to do with you? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So that's Luke chapter 4, and it's plural, possessed by more than one demon. What do we have to do with you? And good theology. He's the Holy One of God. They have Jesus' identity correct. Another one is in Luke 8. Same thing. Uh, like how many are there? Multiple, legion, we are many, 2,000 pigs. A legion would be 6,000 Roman soldiers. And again, correct theology of Jesus. Uh, what do we have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? So they have uh, multiple possessions and correct theology. Just don't believe in Jesus as Savior, but have correct theology. Uh, we look at... Uh, Luke 9, 37, and there'll be another one. Let's uh, read about that. On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, Mount Transfiguration, a large crowd met them. A man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth. And only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Or we would say it this way in English, How long will I put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. So they come down from the mountain, Mount Tabor or Mount Hermon, and they encounter this. I'll review a little bit, but why were there so many demon possessions, possessions in the New Testament? So many more in the New Testament times than there were, say, in the Old Testament. It's not even in the Old Testament. More possessions now uh, are more possessions than now uh, in reading about it. And I actually would limit how much I study about demons except for helping with mental illness. So I figured it was an applied reason to do it. I think I know of two demon possessions in the United States. One is, was in Berkeley. Another one was in South Carolina. And I read it in a theological journal, but later the people that knew about it uh, wrote letters to the church and said, yeah, that was true. They saw that. There was one in South Carolina where there were uh, a boy and his mom and dad, and uh, there were uh, six plus other people watching, a couple of seminary professors, a medical doctor, a psychologist, 
And they said the uh, crucifix on the wall made of metal melted and came down. So I read this in a theological journal and wondered about it. And later the seminary in South Carolina communicated and the person said, yeah, that is what happened. So I would say it can happen today, although I would like to say it's very, very rare, uh, much more in Jesus' time than now. Uh, I think in Jesus' time, uh, what was happening is the devil knew Jesus was in the world. Jesus was going to pay for the sins of the world on the cross. The devil was throwing more demon possession at people. So there are more in New Testament times. Uh, some today, but more in New Testament times than today. I think it's highly overdiagnosed today. But uh, back to New Testament times, more of them because Satan was throwing all kinds of efforts to oppose Jesus and to stop Jesus from dying on the cross. Uh, I also think that God allowed more so that when Jesus delivered them, when Jesus healed them, there would be more and more signs that Jesus has power over Satan. So more at that time than now because Satan was doing more evil work and God was allowing more at that time to prove that Jesus could deliver from demons. Uh, one interesting rabbinic quote from that time was that people expecting the Messiah were looking for someone who had power over Satan. So it was a very good sign. God allowed more and more signs that this is the Savior. He has power over Satan. So I think there were uh, hardly any in the Old Testament, and I think there are some now, but there were more at that time Satan opposing Jesus and God allowing it to show Jesus' power over Satan. About uh, once a month, someone calls the church, and this is because of work with the mentally ill. They want to know about demons. And uh, I always first ask, has this person ever trusted in Jesus as Savior? Do you know that for a fact? And if they say yes, then I say, well, a person cannot be involuntarily taken. So if a person has trusted in Jesus as Savior, do they, do they have any interest in the occult? If they say no, I say it's probably mental illness then. Uh, because people who trust in Jesus as Savior cannot be involuntarily seized. And uh, if they don't have any interest in the occult, then they're... Uh, Symptoms are most likely mental illness. I also ask, have there been anything supernatural? I mean, has there been any, anything supernatural happening? And then when they say no, then I say, well, you're dealing with mental illness. The person has professed faith in Jesus as Savior. They cannot be involuntarily taken. Uh, nothing supernatural in the room. Um, no interest in the occult, I say that is probably mental illness. I think demon possession can happen in our time, but it's probably overdiagnosed. Another thing looking in the Bible, is the person talking in gibberish or are they talking in complete sentences? Because in the Bible, the demon possessed people talked in complete sentences. What do we have to do with you, Jesus, Holy One of God? I know you've come to torment me for the time. Subject, predicate, complete sentence. And uh, mentally ill people that have not been diagnosed and not taken care of, very often they're talking in gibberish. My brother will do that if he's not on his medicine. I've seen it in Washington, D.C., and you come up the subway and there's somebody just raving and talking in word salads and making no sense. That's mental illness. It's not demon possession. They're making no sense. Uh, anyway, not everyone would do this kind of counseling, but uh, in, the, in the book on mental illness, there's a chapter on about six ways to look, whether it's mental illness or demon possession. 
Uh, it can happen, but it's far less in our time than, say, Bible times. It's, it's overdiagnosed. People are often talking in gibberish, not complete sentences, like demon possession is in the Bible. And uh, very often, if someone calls the church for help, the family are believers. They have trusted Jesus as Savior. And very often, they don't want anything to do with the occult. So then it is likely mental illness. Uh, more in that time than now, more because Satan's throwing everything he can at him to stop him. And God allowed it to let Jesus deliver them more signs that he had power. Uh, now for a couple of other applications here that have nothing to do with that subject, we think of the apostles. Uh, the apostles, they were sent out two by two earlier in the chapter, and they could deliver from demons. Now they cannot. So it seems like uh, they followed Jesus and were close and could do their ministry, and then they were more distant from Jesus while he was up on the mountain, and he comes back with the three of them. Uh, now they don't have any power at all. And uh, we could say this about Christian living. Uh, we have to follow Jesus day by day. We have to follow Jesus over time. We cannot count just on success in the past. We have to be close to Jesus now and in the future to have successful lives and have successful ministries. They were close to Jesus when they went out two by two at the beginning of the chapter. They must be more distant now and are not able to do God's plan for their life. Also, it's not here, but I'd like to add the Mark's account where the father says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That's in uh, Mark's parallel, not in Luke, but Mark's parallel. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Um, I think it's very fascinating because you have belief, but you also have some doubts. So it is possible for us over a calendar and over time to have faith but have some doubts. My doubts were the biggest at age 15. It wasn't intellectual. It was the meanness of other Christians. I just uh, wonder who all is going to listen to us. But I, I lived in New York, and the Christians are mean, let alone the unsaved people. And so I thought, man. And uh, the way out of it was to go to the Bible for answers, not worry about how people behave, not worry about how unsaved people behave, not worry about how people that are Christian behave, if I can use the old spiritual song, ain't no flies on Jesus. <laughs> he, he is perfect, and he has the answers. And uh, if we have any doubts, we go to him for answers and go to the Bible for answers. And we uh, uh, cannot be based upon, say, the way other people treat us. So he said uh, in Mark, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Now, uh, Let's us look at uh, the next section, section number two, uh, verse 43 in the middle and following. While everyone was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to the disciples, let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. Now, I don't do it, but my pastor, when I was a kid, every few weeks, let these words sink into your ears. He was always quoting verse 44, which is okay. But Jesus was saying, pay attention. Let these words sink into your ears. And then he's given them the future. Jesus is going to die. Jesus is going to rise again. We've already seen, and it's coming, about the ascension uh, going up. That's verse 51. Jesus taught the disciples about the future. Death, resurrection, ascension. But they didn't tell others about it. And so you have in the Bible Jesus' private teaching about the church age that was coming. But the public teaching was still 
Uh, the king has come. Can you accept him to be as a king? And he wasn't talking about the gospel, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension. Uh, slow down a little bit here because there are times in looking in Jesus' life when he talks about the future church age. We need to apply that to now because he's talking about the future church age. And there are many times when something Jesus teaches is repeated in the Bible after Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So if he talks about the future, that applies. If he talks about something that is repeated by the epistles after Acts chapter 2, that applies. There are one or two things where he's just talking to Jewish people. And they don't apply. I'm doing this to try to make us better at Bible interpretation because when he said, ask for the Holy Spirit to come, he was talking about pre-Pentecost. Everybody who believes now has the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit not yet come because Jesus was not yet glorified, John 7, 39. Well, Jesus is glorified now. He rose and ascended and the Holy Spirit with one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. So when he told the disciples, you can ask for the Holy Spirit, that was a pre-Pentecost. And it doesn't fit for today. There's lots of things where Jesus didn't tell the public. He was teaching just the apostles, but they didn't say anything about it. That's later. So there are things in the Gospels that don't apply. Another one is... The servant of God is cast into outer darkness. Well, he's talking to Jewish people when he said it. Unsaved Jewish people who were in the category of God's servants because they're Jewish. They're unbelievers cast into outer darkness. So we might remember when we interpret Jesus in the Gospels, if it's not repeated in the New Testament uh, after Pentecost, and uh, if it's not future to Jesus' day about the church, then it might just be Jewish. And he's just talking to the listeners there. And the apostles didn't say anything about it until after Pentecost. Now we get to the part I talked about. They saw God's glory on the Mount Transfiguration. And now they're seeing which of them will be the greatest. They saw that uh, glory and they saw that shining and now on the way back from it, on the road, they're not thinking about ministry. They're not thinking about glorifying Jesus. They're not thinking about exalting him. They're thinking about which of them will be the greatest. Verse 46. An argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing that they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by their side. And he said, whoever receives, we'd say welcomes, this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this one is the one who is great. Uh, fitting uh, in the historical context, they left the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw all that glory, and they saw all that shining, and then they come down off the mountain and they're walking down the road and uh, Mark's gospel gives a little bit more. Uh, Jesus knew what they were thinking. What were you thinking about on the way? <laughs> and uh, he knew what they were thinking. Which one of them will have the most glory? He sits them down to talk with them. And a little bit later he brings the child in his midst. I would uh, like to add here 2 Corinthians 10, 12, For when they measure themselves by themselves, when they compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. It is okay to evaluate our life, but not to evaluate which of us is better than the others. Which family is better than the others? Which church is better than the others? Which person is better than the others? That's kind of forbidden by the Bible, not to measure ourselves by ourselves. Uh, how can we uh, evaluate life without measuring self by other people? Well, number one, we can measure the past and the present. Are we improving over the past? Past from the present, are we getting better? We also 
actually should measure ourselves by the perfect God. Be ye perfect, even as your uh, Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. So if we measure ourselves by God, we could say, are we getting closer to being like Jesus over the past several years? So it's all right to measure self by better now than in the past, making improvement. Uh, it's okay to measure self by a little closer to being like Jesus, still not perfect, but we can measure the past and the present. We can measure ourselves against God's perfection. That's actually the standard. We're not supposed to compare ourselves with other Christians. Um, if we think about human nature, it's very common. Uh, I could probably get a television and turn the news on. Basically, what they're saying is, I am greater than everybody. It's very, very common to compare self to other people and say, I'm better. Uh, Jesus is saying, uh, what's the best? And he's actually saying, people who care about kids. I don't know whether the mother was standing by, but that sort of makes sense. If his child is really little, you'd think the mother is with it. Uh, I think uh, mother or father or both are with it. So uh, who's the greatest? Well, somebody who cares about this child is the greatest. And it seems like for the last couple of millennium, uh, we don't think of parenting that highly. I like, what is the greatest? Uh, ministry to kids? What is the greatest? Raising the kids, caring about them. It won't get much of society's attention. Um, we have it because we have partly a Christian culture, but if you take the pagan culture, it is getting more anti-child all the time, both with abortion and with the care for them. So, uh, wow. Wow. To me, an indication of not caring about kids is an indication of not caring about God. Who is the greatest? Somebody who cares about family care, somebody who cares about child ministry. Now we'll move on. Uh, I would like to not spend much time on demon possession in verses 49 and 50, but there's another one. Somebody else is doing it in verse 49, and at verse 50, Jesus says, He who is not against you is for you. Now, I would apply that to evaluating other Christians. Um, basically, I have three categories. Number one is just like us. I mean, right down to, I mean, we're, we're pro-Israel, they're pro-Israel. We're for uh, baptism of those who are already believers, not so much baptizing the babies. Uh, if they're just like us, then that's like category number one. Then there's other batches of Christians that are not just like us, but they're not, they're not heretics yet. They believe in the Trinity and the virgin birth and the deity of Jesus and the resurrection. He's coming back sometime and trusting him as Savior. Uh, the most divergency would be whether... Uh, eternal security is true. That's like top among the real Christians. And then uh, also whether you're pro-Israel or not. So you have like level one, they're just like us. And they do exist. There's lots of them. And uh, that's like level one. Level two is like they're not just like us, but they're real Christians. And so my view of that is to not attack them at church all the time. Uh... I have seen websites and would get mailers where it's like enemy of the week. Every sermon is attacking other Christians, the enemy of the week. I think this verse 50 is telling us not to do that. That uh, uh, most effort and money just like us, others not just like us, but still Christians. And the goal of living is not to attack them all the time. Um, can teach on those things, but to do it in a way where it's not harsh. Then there's level three, which is like uh, they do deny the deity of Christ. They do deny salvation by faith. They do deny the resurrection. 
Well, those are heretics. But in verse 50, he's telling, telling us to uh, keep the criticism to a minimum. Now we looked at verse 51 last week because I went ahead a little bit. Let's go ahead and read it. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him, or again, as we'd say it, they did not welcome him, because he was traveling towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them parenthesis, and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. I thought I would say, in the past, we've noticed that Luke didn't say this, but Mark and Matthew did. And in the past, much of Luke is a little bit shorter. However, Luke 9.51 all the way through chapter 18 is only in Luke. So Luke has been abbreviating and readers have already met Matthew and Mark and leave out, you know, leave out, quote, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, and leave out this, leave out that. But we get to, we get to this verse, it's only in Luke. So the, the book is just as big. It has left out a few things that were in the previous Gospels, but now it's only in Luke. Verse 51, uh, uh, he talked earlier about an exodus going out. The exodus is uh, from this life to a resurrection. It includes the ascension going up in glory. And we mentioned it says in verse 51, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. That's the best way to translate it. I didn't know how you would make it literal, but like I said last time, the literal is he set his face like a flint, which is really, really weird. And uh, campers would know about a flint. You hit it, you hit it, you hit it, you hit it, and make a fire. Well, what he's saying is Jesus was getting struck, Jesus was getting hit, Jesus was getting opposed. They were trying to keep him back and oppose him, and he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to die for our sins and rise again. He set his face like a flint means that despite being struck at and hit all the time, he's going to just keep going. So weird, literal, and it wouldn't make sense in English. They just said determined to go, but he set his face like a flint. Now the fastest way to go from Galilee to Jerusalem is to go straight south through Samaria. But very often Jewish people didn't do it. And this is why. The Samaritans said you should worship at our temple at Mount Gerizim. You should not go to the temple in Jerusalem. And some Samaritans were believers in a different village with the woman at the well. And Jesus said, the salvation is of the Jews. The temple in Jerusalem is the right temple. Not the Samaritan one in Mount Gerizim. So at this village, they didn't want him to come. Later, they're going to become believers in the book of Acts, a whole lot of them. So uh, he's not going to burn them all up. Some of them are going to become believers in the book of Acts. But this time, he goes around it. We do see James and John here. If you want us to burn them all up, uh, I think that after Pentecost and when they wrote their books, they become a lot more gracious. So did the Apostle Paul, who wanted to go arrest Christians and very, very angry, very, very mean. Jesus just says, I won't go there right now. And uh, no, <laughs> and they're going to have to change and be more gracious. And later, the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8 will Many will trust in Jesus as Savior, um, but we see Jesus gracious here in uh, both of the last two paragraphs. If they're not totally against you, don't fight them all the time. And the Samaritans, well, okay, I just won't go there now. Later they will be believers, but he really thought James and John 
were, like Mark chapter 3, sons of thunder. So hatred and anger is not the ministry. And always attacking other Christians is not the ministry. And he's just going to go around them. A lot of people in those days did. They would go from Galilee. They would cross the Jordan and go to the east. They would go all the way down, what we call the nation of Jordan. Then they would go back west and come up the Jericho Road. A lot of Jews up in Galilee did not go through Samaria. They didn't like each other. They would go this, cross the Jordan, go down, come back up. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ will do now. You might notice some are in parentheses. And every Greek New Testament has footnotes. Uh, it's probably not real, but it's in one that's in a Smithsonian about A.D. 400. So just in case, that's what our editors did. They put it in footnotes, some of verse 55 and 56, but it's not in a lot of the earlier ones. Just one I would like to cover the next three and take them one at a time. He's uh, going. He's uh, going to go to Jerusalem. He, they're not going to stop him. And then there's uh, three different responses, 57 and 58. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Well, uh, volunteer, I'll follow you everywhere. And Jesus is saying, just realize you're not going to get rich. So uh, Jesus did have supporters. A lot of the ladies mentioned in Luke chapter 8, verse 3, Susanna and Joanna. He did have supporters, but he really didn't even have a house. He was always on the move. If he stayed anywhere, he stayed at Peter's house in Capernaum. Now, verse 59 and 60 is the other direction. Not a volunteer, but Jesus said, You, follow me. Verse 59, he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go everywhere and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. So Jesus made the command... Then there was an excuse, and I think probably the previous generation was still with us. He's just saying, I can't do it this year, I can't do it next year, I've got to wait until Dad goes. And Jesus said, you go everywhere. I'm always reminded of a class at Dallas Seminary where the guy's waving around a book, and he said, somebody wrote a book that says God no longer calls people. It's only in the New Testament, only for the apostles. You got a whole room full of pastors. They said, how many of you agree with this? Nobody. <laughs> and here's a case of a non-apostle, an ordinary person being called. You go everywhere. Verse 61 and 62, don't turn back. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And the hymn, No Turning Back, would have fit. Once we are serving Jesus, we're not supposed to go backwards. We're not supposed to go in another direction. Lots of lessons, even though it's Jesus' story, not to compare self to others. Uh, more cases of demon possession in New Testament than now, maybe a few. But if a person's a believer and doesn't want anything to do with the occult, uh, their problems are probably mental illness, not demon possession. Uh, following Jesus, uh, even if he... Uh, we not worry about riches and following Jesus, never to turn back. Now we've seen the 12 go out two by two, and uh, as we get to chapter 10, now he has 70, 70 going out two by two, and we'll take a look at that next time. Will the musicians please come, we'll get ready for communion. <laughs>